I mean, essentially, money is just energy. It's nothing more than that. It's like one big dance, but sometimes we don't dance very well with each other. Without knowing that something represents money, push it away. You know, they push away the representative. Hi, Barbara. Hi, Tiana. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you too. I'm so delighted to be able to talk to you about money and family constellations. And I personally experienced your work. I tend to interview people on my channel who I've worked with. Oh. Uh, and you are you have a background of gestalt psychotherapy, gestalt therapy. Gestalt, yeah. Gestalt. And uh, you've been doing family constellations work for a long time, mm -hmm. 25 years, since 1997. You do individual work, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, group work. And you also train family constellation therapist and you also have written two books uh three so there's a huge body of credibility and i think all of your wisdom around money and family constellations will be really useful for people who might be stuck around various money issues mm -hmm. i've got quite a lot long list of questions but is yeah. there anything about your work that you'd like to say before we get going i think you've covered it all really yeah i love what i do i guess that could be added yeah yeah <laughs> Something I feel very passionate about. That's always a good thing. <laughs> so what are the um, most important principles to know about money and its deeper roots in family consolation work? I mean, essentially money is just energy. It's nothing more than that. And then we put onto it all kinds of things and belief systems and ways of being. And often that is a mirror of how we are with originally with our parents, you know, whether we reject them, whether we reach towards them, whether we don't respect them, all those attitudes that we have initially uh, towards our parents are just mirrored in relation to our relationship with money. Uh, and then there seems to be another trend. It's not an absolute, because as you know, with constellations, there are no absolutes, but a pointer towards something around the father's relationship with his father. Uh, that was... Um, First of all, written about by a Japanese woman, Chetna Kobayashi, and she wrote an article for the journal. And she fell on hard times herself, really hard time. Somebody somehow anonymously put some money through her door, which was quite incredible. <laughs> but she discovered from that that there seems to be a pointer towards the father's relationship with his father. So the male line can be broken, and if the male line is broken, Given that archetypally the father is the person who, in a way, helps the child out into the world, you know, so initially the child is in the mother's sphere of influence and the father is responsible for helping them to separate from the mother and take them out into the world. It's a very archetypal symbol, if you like, but essentially it's still there in some way or other. Money represents going out into the world. If there's a break in that male line, it seems to have quite a strong effect on the person. But there's also, I mean, Bert Hellinger, the band that he wrote about, mother is the root of success or something like that. So there's also our movement towards our mother. And that is very strong because in the early days, you know, we're, we grow in our mother's womb. We're born out of our mother's body. So that's a very primary relationship. And how we are in our lives will be really directly related to that related to that early person. And there are people who, like many of us, have dysfunctional family relationships that are not always fun and they're dysfunctional. If one is stuck around that, and there might be people watching who are in that situation, what should one do? You know, I don't like the word should, <laughs> but I think if people are uh, open to doing constellation work, it really does provide a possibility of something new. Um, because I think, you know, with parents, we have what we call the small truths, you know, which are the stories that we have about our families, mm -hmm. grown out of our childhood experiences, of course. Mm -hmm. but, but they're not putting the parents in the context of all the trauma and difficulty they might have been through in their own lives. And if constellations show that, then it may widen our lens on the family as a whole. And, you know, if you've been part of, Bigger cultures where, for instance, in slavery or partition, you know, we talk about India, um, that will be mirrored in the family in some way. 
So I think once you really grasp that and you see your parents in the middle of that trauma, eventually something changes. Now, when you say dysfunctional, that covers a whole range, of course. <laughs> and sometimes the dysfunction, as you refer to it, it can be kind of the opposite of distance and lack of contact can be too intense and too difficult. And then we may need to pull away for a while just to kind of regather ourselves, get a sense of who we are. But ultimately, if we really want to be self-accepting with inner peace, then we need to go, to go back and embrace our parents um, uh, and accept that, okay, I am who I am because my parents are who they are. Um, and mirror, mirror on the wall, I am my mother after all. You know, so <laughs> one little thing. <laughs> And the the man, you know, mirror, mirror on the wall, I'm my father after all. Um, so, you know, those essential things, if you really can come to terms with that eventually, but you may need to go through a process first, the life is much happier. You know, and there's a lot of people go off on spiritual, what's the word, spiritual research, you know, they go off on uh, finding gurus and that kind of thing. Um, or they could do, self-acceptance workshops but, but it's actually very simple you know if you just take your parents in accept them as they are self-acceptance goes alongside that and the gratitude the gratitude for life yeah yeah mm. and it's not that those spiritual journeys aren't valuable i think some people get a lot from you know finding a guru feeling loved and that sort of stuff but in the end they're surrogates you have to come back to the basic fact that life came to you through your parents. And there's no way around that. <laughs> and if you're adopted, you're natural parents. Uh, even though that's extremely painful because you're rejected very early, it is the essence of life. And money is life. Yeah. Money is a part of your life force. And if your life force is flowing towards your mother, towards your father, then money will be there and you'll move towards it it will come to you and it just flows in and out yeah that's kind of a simplification of course but essentially that's what it is i remember when i did my uh, money family consolation with you which was about four years ago with ty francis it was a very powerful experience i didn't know much about it i asked a question and i kind of got thrown into a consolation uh and I remember, uh, not my consolation, thankfully money was always by my side, uh, playing different roles, but always near me, which is really good because, you know, I'm a financial advisor, so it would not be a good thing if money didn't like me. But <laughs> I, there were some consolations where I think at one point money walked out of the room and, and you were like, come back and, you know, see if you can stay here as when you represented money. Um, so I'm sure you have some great stories about how money plays out in people's lives, but do you have any sort of examples? Well, I mean, that, that money walking out, I've no experience in a constellation, constellation actually. I, what I have experienced more is money just standing there and saying, well, I'm here. I'm here. If you all, got, all you've got to do is see me and come towards me and, and I, I'll give you what you want. You know, so there's a sort of a, a way in which money is just there, a mirror, holding up a mirror for you in terms of how you are in life and how you are in your family. Um, and, you know, I've seen people kind of, without knowing that something represents money, push it away. You know, <laughs> They push away the representative. Uh, and so, you know, there's, there's a wider thing as well about loyalty to class. I think that is a factor. Um, and sometimes, you know, we tell ourselves, oh, I can't, I can't be wealthy because I come from working class. You know, my mum was working class, my dad was working class. And I had some of that. My dad was definitely working class in his attitude and in reality. Uh, so, you know, it's quite hard for me when I start to draw money towards me to hold on to it and not want to get rid of it, you know, to return to that place of loyalty. So I think that's a, something that you can see in constellations where people are loyal to, loyal to a bigger picture. It's not just to do with that particular constellation, but something running underneath it, you know. So, but, yeah, I mean, 
when I was with Ty, this is Ty's thing, he came up with three ways of looking at money. One is this movement, and then one is, uh, you know, so where people kind of hang on to it and they don't allow the flow, they're sort of anxious and saving it. And then the other is a bit of both, you know, where you kind of push it away, but also you bring it towards you like an ambivalent relationship. And, you know, that's exactly the same with attachment relationships to parents. Yeah. I reject my parents, I cling to them or they cling to me and it's too close, you know, too intense, I need some space. Or I'm ambivalent, you know, I want them to come towards me, but also will reject them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and so there isn't flow, really, with any of those. You know, the flow would be, it comes in and it goes out, and it comes in and it goes out, you know, it's a pretty much um, more, a simpler process. You know? I had heard about those three movements before, but I hadn't connected it to the relationship with one's parents or one's family or when, where one belongs in the family system. So that's really interesting. And it sort of correlates to the Buddhist teachings of craving, aversion and ignorance. Uh, which I really like, which are sort of just human patterns of, you know, I like this, I don't like this, or um, I don't want to engage, I'm checked out. Uh, what came up for me when you were speaking about class was how we are so hardwired for connection and belonging, and we are part of the bigger system. I mean, when I, every time I go back to India, it makes me, even when I live there, it makes me really uncomfortable to see people in such a dire poverty, you know. Uh, unimaginable poverty and it's it's a very uh, horrible feeling and I see that also when I run money workshops is there's a general discomfort with how our money systems uh, you know aren't <laughs> they don't prioritize human needs they you know the, the way the way we operate um, for whatever reason it's there's scarcity there's competition there's fear and there's like an accumulation and there's a lot of this going on what are some practical things that one could do to have a more friendlier relationship with money for example one of the things that i learned was about just being grateful to one's parents for life you know for life yeah yeah, yeah. then you're grateful for money you know i think this the respect for money comes in as well. You know, if I, I have a tendency to do this, you know, I leave money lying around or I forget where it is or I don't take enough notice of how much money I have in my account, that kind of thing. <clears throat> and I think that's around respect. And that also comes into the parental relationship. You know, if I have respect for money, money respects me. <laughs> you know, so the flow, the, the flow in both directions is a lot easier so you know i think that's certainly a factor and do you see a lot of aversion with money because i think one of the reasons that people like me are in business is because lots of people don't want to engage with money they don't want to like look at it it's admin it's boring it's oh i can't you know i just don't want dirty. to look at it <laughs> it's dirty, <yes. laughs> i mean there's a wonderful money game that you can do which uh, i remember finding very valuable where you I mean, if I say it in advance, nobody's going to be able to do the game. But basically, there are three stages to a game where you're initially giving, and then you're taking, and then you're bartering. And it's to demonstrate, and you do it with real money, and it's to demonstrate what feelings come up when, you, when you're dealing with each of those three. And the most dramatic example I have of that is when I was in Romania, and I was, I don't know if it was running a workshop or doing a training, I can't remember, but I, brought this money game in and when we came to the giving everybody sat in the chair so nobody in the group wanted to give a penny to anybody else and it's really interesting and of course that's a country with a very strong history of poverty i mean i guess that's true in india as well yeah i mean we have quite a bit of poverty here but i don't think it's on the scale of india but you know that that inability to give it's really strong. Now, when I did the workshop for the first time, this money game, there was a guy there who was extremely wealthy. He was the only guy with 26 women, I think it was. Um, and he began to accumulate money. When he got to the bartering stage, he was refusing. Women were coming and asking him for money and he was refusing. And in the giving stage, they would add money to his pile, but with a kind of contempt, you know, they throw more money on. <laughs> So it was really fascinating, you know, as he was accumulating money, 
people were adding more money, even though they felt really contemptuous about it. And at the end, he said he put himself under a test. He was wealthy, and he wanted to see if he could live with his guilt about it. And, and so once he said that, you know, it was like all this made absolute sense. Yeah. There were women who literally didn't have enough money to go home, <laughs> um, had no train fare, nothing, you know, and they were asking for money, and he was saying no. And I think we have a, this capitalist system which feeds the rich and starves the poor. You know, I've been poor, I've been to the bank, and they will not lend you money if you don't have any collateral. It's same strange, you know, the opposite of what's really needed. And then if you have collateral, they'll give you a load more. <laughs> so it's an upside down system. But there was a man in, uh, I think it was Bangladesh, yeah. he won a Nobel for peace prize. And he was in Bangladesh and he saw these women in dire poverty. Um, and they were paying huge sums of money to loan for. I'll give you the money and you repay me when you can. He said it was such small amounts that they were borrowing, but they were paying such huge sums. And they went off. I think they would sell him, well, renting mobile phones or something. They made a lot of money and they came back and they paid him back, you know. And so he saw that actually, if we can build something on trust, like that, you can work miracles. And so he reversed the banking system. You know, he said, I'm not going to lend you money if you've got collateral. I'm only going to lend money to those who don't have it. Yeah. And initially, he charged no interest at all. And they were paying back. And then after a while, he charged very small amounts of interest. But then he tried it in the States and it didn't work. Really interesting. <laughs> Yeah, he founded Grameen Bank. I read the book. I cannot remember his name, but yes. yeah. You know, you know, not using the words to say. Yunus, Yunus. Oh, uh, gosh. Yeah. The, the name escapes me. But yeah, it's an amazing story of how, with his vision and his faith and belief and understanding and being in the culture of the Bangladeshi community and being able to work out what their needs are and providing a very grassroots, not a highfalutin sort of solution, but like very grassroots, a very simple way to address needs, yeah. And so, you know, whatever we do in constellations, that bigger field of what's going on is, is also influential in some ways. So when you live in a capitalist system, and you may have these flow in your family, you've also got to work with the living with the capitalist system that you're in. And that's not always easy, you know, if you, if you come from poverty, if you come from a very working class background, then living with wealth and attracting wealth is harder. Um, and if you've come from a, you know, a very rich background and you're used to money, then you have a sense of entitlement. If you don't have to work for it, but, you know, it should come to you without any effort, that kind of thing. So those belief systems are also still there. Yeah, because we, we don't exist in isolation. You know, the field, the bigger field is influential as well. It'd be interesting to do constellations, you know, somewhere, I don't know, where they don't, don't value money at all. You know, that would be really interesting to do. But Romania, you know, there is a lot of poverty in Romania. Yeah, and the communist um, regime was... Yeah. Was, had, it's, had, a, had a hard influence on the people there. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I've been working with people who had all their property taken by the communists, you know, and then they had to prove that it was their property when they tried to claim it back, you know, so very difficult and a lot of corruption and that sort of thing that they were living with in the government, you know, so, so I, I discovered a lot, learned a lot in the constellations. And yeah. And I take your points about capitalism and I also have mixed feelings about it, but uh, I, I also think it could be any system because it seems like humans can pretty much take any system and then like socialism or communism or yeah. any. So yeah. sometimes I think it's moneyism because th there's beautiful things about capitalism, you know, human ingenuity and being able to borrow uh, when in the right, when done in the right way, it can be uh, in a very healthy um, and expansive flow in service of life. Yeah. And yeah. And then I think, Maybe it's our sort of inner sense of lack or scarcity thinking that, and this fear that I won't have enough. Yes. And 
I'm sure you've you've seen it like this this man with all this wealth who mm. was just playing a game and wanting to have more and to see if he would be guilty. Mm. Uh, is there there seems to be a mechanism where we're not really in touch with our true needs or we've bought into this lie that we you know more is more more is better. Um so I suppose how if you have these feelings of scarcity but you know that you probably have enough, you know. And then it's about really like if you do the constellation, this is what I like about constellation work, you know, it either widens your belief or it really strongly challenges your belief. So it might show you something that's completely at odds with what we've always believed, you know. So if you think money runs away from you, you know, and then in the constellation money's running towards you, you know, or saying you know, you can come towards me, here I am with my arm wide open you know then then it's like it really challenges your beliefs uh, and that's a really healthy thing and that's what i like with constellations you know it's like saying yeah you know this is what you've always believed well let's have a look at what's actually there you know and then see if you can widen your lens a bit um, and then thereby change your attitude change your belief system yeah because like you said it's the interdependence and we are not one solitary individual in an island with our own little conditionings but we are affected by the systems so for example i remember in my constellation we had india my father was from a portuguese colonized you know but he was indian but but he had a um, portuguese grandfather so there were all these different influences then there's also the influence of patriarchy then i'm an immigrant so there was also like the uk influence and of course my family uh yeah so it's it's considering all of these things and something does shift when you can see from that lens and also there's a lot of conversations about intergenerational trauma so sometimes you can do the individual work and you know work on your affirmations work on your sense of scarcity go to individual therapy but there is a like a barrier you can't get past something else that's going on and i really like that constellations can give you that extra lift because I work with clients on an individual basis. So I'm not a therapist, so you know, I can't say let's go to a constellation or something. But I try to open the door to say there could be more going on here. Have you thought about, you know? Mm. Yeah, I mean that, you know, people with a colonial history for instance, mm. they have huge guilt feelings about accumulating wealth. You know, and it's not their personal feelings, it's the feelings of their ancestors, mm -hmm. yeah, the guilt that was there for the way we treated, you know, and the British in particular, you know, we've, we've been all over the world and created all kinds of havoc, including poverty, you know, and so there's the two sides of that, you know, there's the attachment to poverty if you come from a colonized country, and then there's the attachment to guilt if you come from the colonizing ancestry, you know, um, because as soon as you accumulate money, then there's a repeat of, you know, what happened in the past and, and you feel guilty about it. And the, the beauty with constellations is that you can work with that, you know, so you can set up a line of victims, for instance, you know, slavery, for instance, you can set up a line of slaves and then you set up a line of perpetrators, the colonizers, and you see these two energies opposite each other. And if you really look and allow the souls of each to touch each other, then something wonderful can happen. You know, there can be a movement beyond the good and the bad and the right and the wrongs of it. You know? uh, and that's really lovely to see. And it takes a long time because people's belief systems are so rigidly held onto. And as you say, that's also to do with the longing. You know, I have to hold on to my belief system around working class because otherwise all my friends are going to throw me out. You know, there's that sort of basic need in all of us to feel that we belong to some kind of community. And if that community is in one direction or the other, we can be really influenced like political. You know, if we belong into a political party, if we belong to the socialist party, you know, it's then very difficult for us to marry that with some of our own belief systems if we come from a very wealthy, colonizing country, for instance, or, or our family have been colonizers or, you know, that kind of thing. So I think it's really revealing what can come up with the constellation work around all our history. It's our history and the unconscious stuff that's come back through generations. Like people 
have taken land from somebody else or have lost the piece of land. I mean, we did that with the Irish. The British did that with the Irish. You know, we took we took their land. You know, and so to face that is is hard because the other aspect is that we are very judgmental. You know, we feel judgment towards ourselves, and then that brings shame. And if we're in shame, we don't look. We can't look at the consequences that we affect what we've done, um, and then. If we're judging the other, we're into blame and the accusation and anger. And equally, we're not really nothing, you know. So both sides of that keep things stuck and keep the other thing stuck. And the people who suffer then are the descendants, the next generation and the one after. Because they're caught in that stuck energy of hatred or shaming, ills and alternatives, you know. So if you did this line... Um, as you say, and the perpetrators and the victims could face some of what was done. They could re-enable the flow of love to a certain extent and stop the game yeah. continuing. Because otherwise, does it just keep going? It keeps going. And then, you know, after a couple of decades, it flips over the other way and the perpetrators become victims and victims become perpetrators. You know, so uh, that happens all over the world and you can you can see it happening. So... You know, I don't know that constellations can cure all these huge issues, but at least they can shine a light on it. And once you see it, something does change. And, I, you know, I've seen some very moving constellations, but Helen in particular did around this issue, victims and perpetrators. And I did see shifts happen within the workshop. Whether that changes anything on a the, on the bigger scale, who knows? You know, we can't know how much influence we have because the movements seem to happen all by themselves sometimes, you know, like whether it's apartheid, the end of apartheid, the Berlin Wall, bringing down the Berlin Wall, those massive movements will show that we're part of something much bigger than us as individuals. We're not individuals, really, uh, even though we live in a left-brain, individualistic, capitalistic world, you know. It's like one big dance, but sometimes we don't dance <laughs> very well <laughs> with each other. We, right. yeah. we dance on purpose, badly, just to, I don't know. Yes. <laughs> um, could you share your experiences with nature constellations? Because there's a lot of anxiety and anger and, uh, yeah, and just um, hope maybe also about saving the planet. Yeah, it's an interesting one, saving the planet. Yeah. I don't think the planet needs saving at all. It's Not up. from us, yeah. Yes, we need yeah. to ourselves somehow. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, the, the thing with nature constellations is that they do bring home to us more clearly than anything else, probably, how we're not separate. You know, human nature, we are nature. It's not something that's out there and over there that we need to do something about, either save or, or control or annihilate. We are. We are nature. We're just not separate from us. Uh, and I think that realization can change something really massively and I think it gives a, an understanding of constellations on another level because it's less personal so our personal stories aren't caught up in it in the same way. So I think I shared the story of a being of I was in Germany with Francesca Morton Ball and most people in the constellations will know her because she's well known to nature constellation. And we were outside in this very beautiful garden, very peaceful, um, and sitting in a circle. And she was talking about an age of oscillations, and she said, all we need to do with nature is discuss, and nature will respond. And as she said it, this flock of birds came overhead, circling around over us and making a huge noise. And she just said, thank you, and then they flew away. <laughs> it was just magical for me I and mean, I've never gotten it because it was, it was so incredible we know such a sign that yeah nature's there once we listen it's there and so you know if I'm running a constellation and an insect or it comes into the space or it's, you know the weather suddenly changes you take it all into a plane because that's nature communicating with us and suddenly a dog will start barking or something you know, out of nowhere and then they stop when the constellation shifts you know, so, 
Well, I think that link between us and nature, well, it's not a link. We are nature. We're all part of this morphic field that Rupert Sheldrick speaks about. We are. I was once in a constellation where there were, we were doing something about two brothers squabbling and two cats had a wow, wow outside in the window for about three minutes. It was a very powerful. Yeah. And, and we just stopped and then it, they had, they were in, they were expressing something that was there, you know. It happens all the time, you know, and uh, I was representing a snail once. I think this was also with Francesca and she was a, so sometimes in nature constellations, you just all stand up together and you wait until something moves you, some aspect of nature. And there was wind and volcano, all kinds of stuff, you know, and I didn't know at the time what they represented, but, you know, an awful lot going on. And what came to me was a snail. And I was so resistant and this, oh, I don't want to represent a snail, you know, fighting against my bodily response to it. So in the end, I surrendered to it, went down on the ground. And I was just crawling along the ground very slowly and all this activity was going on around me. And then I reached out towards another representative without knowing what she was. And she represented a clover. It's really beautiful. And then Francesca said, so afterwards, just see what message is coming to you from that aspect of nature. And the message I got was, there is huge abundance. I mean, this relates to money. There is huge abundance just in front of you. All you have to do is reach for it. It was just amazing. And then I saw, you know, I had a big garden at the time and I went into my greenhouse and I saw that I used to throw the snails over the fence, you know, because they were eating my tomatoes. And I, I saw this snail, you know, in a totally different way. And I, I said, thank you, you know, thank you for coming to me. I've learned an awful lot about you, you know. I'm not going to leave you on my tomatoes, but I'm not going to throw you over the wall. I <laughs> think so I kind of moved it somewhere else. So that was, that was a real gift from nature for me, basically. And, you know, here's, here's the abundance. It's right there. All you've got to do is move towards it. <laughs> and that's why. That's what money represents. There's the abundance. It's what our parents represent. They've got massive gifts to give us. They do give us massive gifts. Like, nothing bigger than life. All we have to do is reach for it. And it's just there waiting when we're ready. Yeah, and we might go through all sorts of processes beforehand. But eventually we can do We can do that. We just reach out and there it is. Yeah, and lots of people, I suppose, ignore their issues with money or may pretend like they haven't got any issues with money but then they start a business or they go to dinner and somebody doesn't pay for their share and then instantly things get very aerated yeah and sometimes yeah. even when i organize money workshops and we talk about money the energy is there you know it's very meta it but can it's there. it can get activated yeah. like one time i was talking to a workshop another another lady and i said so we'll do a 70 30 split uh, it, if that's okay with you. And she's like, ooh, uh, I don't know about 70, 30. So she, I was suggesting I would take 30, she would take 70, you know? Right. And then, then we had an email exchange and we sorted it out. But instantly, like, you know, like, even if you've done a lot of work and money workshops and, you know, uh, it, it it's there. It's, it's, um, yeah, I mean, I can see it in myself, you know, like I can get really activated if I think somebody's taking me for granted. Mm. You know, I can be very generous hearted, you know, if I see someone's really in need, but if I have the slightest whiff <laughs> that they're taking me for granted, then I get really, you know. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. After 25 years of doing constellations, it's very human and endearing to hear that. That's good. It gives me hope. Strong reactivity, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and again, you know, I mean, that's in a way something that Constellations has given me. I feel it so strongly energetically. Mm. You know, when someone's genuinely in need, I can feel my energy just going out very easily, flowing towards them. And then if they start to, you know, if it twists and I've started to feel used, the energetic link between us totally changes, you know, and I, 
<laughs> I want to do this, you know. No, not having it. <laughs> the easy, harmonious flow gets interrupted and the giving is not easily forthcoming. Yeah, there's like protective barriers going up. Yeah. And, you know, you see the stream parents and children, mm. you know, they give pocket money and then they say, you can't spend it on this. You can only spend it on that. Or no, you mustn't have that. It's this and this and this. Well, that's, that's not unconditional pocket money. You know, it's... Uh, money that is on certain conditions, well, that tightens it. You know, the flow flows in. I mean, if you can give your pocket money to, to the child and say, for you to do with what you want, then the flow is there. And, you know, maybe they will go and buy just sweets the first time round, but they what? You know, they'll learn from that experience, you know. <laughs> so I think it's a tricky one, particularly between parents and children, how they manage their money and how children learn to manage money. Yeah, and this question comes up often when I speak to some of my clients. They say, well, my husband thinks I should help them with all their uni expenses. I got a loan. I thought it was very good for me not to get any help. I see that they've inherited a different world. I want to help. But, you know, or sometimes a mom will say, um, I really want to, you know, make life easy for my daughter, but not too easy because I don't want her to have so much money that she ends up being ungrateful or, you know, like um, like a brat or like entitled. And so it's quite hard when parents talk about, and sometimes it's bigger sums like inheritances, you know, uh, how, how sh what, what could, a, what principles could a parent keep in mind to be able to pass on wealth also in a way that it's received by the child without all the entrapments yeah. of what comes <laughs> with the burden of money. Hellinger says, don't believe any inheritance. <laughs> <laughs> that simplifies it. It makes <laughs> havoc, you know. <laughs> right. It causes so much difficulty. And I think if you leave a lot of money, and I saw this with somebody who lived fairly locally, you know, he'd got so much money from his parents, he had nothing to work for. And he was kind of lost, you know. He was like in this world where he could have everything he wanted, but, but what, what did he have to aim for or to move towards, you know? And I felt really sorry for him. I thought, God, I wouldn't want that, you know, that much well, that you lose your urge to do something, to create something, to gain something, you know, move forwards in life. So there's something, I think, in what the hell are you say? But uh, the other thing, I think, is a lot of parents kind of meddle you know, they might leave different amounts to different children and stuff like that. Or they change their will the last minute because they crossed with one of the members of the family, you know. Or you've got certain cultures where the eldest gets more or gets the land or something like that. And that sets up all kinds of difficulties between siblings, you know. So I think it's tricky. I think inheritance is tricky. I mean, you know, my parents didn't leave us very much. Um, and, you know, we had kind of pieces of furniture and that sort of thing. And we were fine. You know, we just divided it amongst us and, you know, where we were both wanting the same thing, we just tossed a coin, you know, <laughs> and we just managed it all right. So there wasn't these huge sums or houses or complicated things to have to deal with. And I, I'm glad about that. I, I wouldn't want that level of responsibility, you know, to have to deal with all of that. So I think, yes, parents who do leave an inheritance just need to be mindful that it might be a burden in some way or other and to, to manage it, you know. And on the side of the recipient, if you were a child who received this inheritance, what could you do to allow that to feel less of a burden? Because I, I, I see the disengagement, you know, like the, the client will come and say, I got this inheritance, and then they don't really look at it. It's almost like it's there, but it's not really theirs. They haven't worked hard for it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a rejection because it, it isn't something that's worked for. But, you know, you can also do amazing things in the world. Mm -hmm. And, the, you know, a lot of famous people do that, don't they? They earn all these huge sums of money. I mean, what's his name? Will I am, you know, he, I remember him saying that he was doing amazing work and I think he used to blunder or something, you know, helping black people, teenagers to get out of the poverty trap and that sort of stuff. So there are things that you can do. You know, you can 
passings on. You can be magnanimous. You can set up a trust or in something, some new sponsorship or something like that. So I think that helps. You know, it's like not just sitting on it or pretending you haven't got it, rejecting it, that sort of stuff. Well, of course, it's not doing that or that. <laughs> it's going, well, how can we help go here? Oh, well, yeah, I mean, it's the same with life. You know, I get life and I pass it on. I'm grateful, thank you very much. I pass it on and the river flows on. Last week to the next generation, or some calls or some charity or something like that. The one make of the new supposed thing. I think if we do that, I don't have too much infighting on the way with siblings, um, then it can be okay. You know, but I, I, I do, I think there's something in what the hell would say. Leaving inheritance. Yeah, there are some very famous people like Warren Buffett, one of the wealthiest investors in the world. He's leaving most of it to charities. He's right. helping his children, but within limits. Like it's nothing compared to the wealth, you know. And it's very conscientious. And one of his sons has gone on to do quite a lot of work with conservation, nature conservation. And yeah. what you said about money being like like wanting to flow also reminds me of this book, The Soul of Money by Lynn Twist, and she says money is like a river, you know, it doesn't like being stagnant. Yeah, and I use that image often for constellations, you know, it's the same, like life and love, and you can just add and money flow down to the ocean, right? Mm. So from before to now to after, yeah. and, the, and the kind of boulders in the river are where we get stuck. Hmm. And if you can see those boulders, you might be able to lift them out. Or you might, you know, if they're really stuck there, then you just need to acknowledge that they're there. You know, maybe my ancestors have lost all their land and I can't ever get it back. But if I can see that boulder, it makes a difference. I'm facing it. That's my history. And our ancestors mostly or always want us to succeed? Oh, I think so. Always, yeah. 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 It's, yeah. That, it's love that's going yeah. Yeah. Down the line, yeah. So a question from a slightly selfish perspective. Well, I don't know if it's selfish, but um, I'm childless. And you mentioned that this work can also help, not in all circumstances, but in some circumstances, it can help to clear obstacles in fertility. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know how many. I mean, I have a lovely example of one couple where they were together, interestingly, often arguing about money. <laughs> So they came to me for Gestalt therapy initially, and they'd been together 11 years, married 11 years. And um, they came to a workshop together, and I first of all worked on his line, and his, I think it was his grandfather, he was in the First World War, and his house was bombed, and everybody was killed except him, he was the only survivor. And when I lined up the men, they wouldn't touch each other. So the line was really broken. It was really interesting. And when this truth came out, the men started to move towards each other. And this client felt then this line of men behind him. And he could see him. He kind of grew his stature. So I grabbed the moment and then I brought his wife alongside him. And she sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. You know, and she said, that's the first time I really felt him fully as a man. I mean, she had her own issues and we did her consolation for, but it was pitiful. Now, she's somebody who's quite tuned in to her body and she rang me following me, so excited. She said, I know I'm pregnant. I know I conceived this child on the night after the consolation. <laughs> Join up, did have a baby nine months later, and she calls her her constellations baby, and she's, she's in her 20s now or something. <laughs> but that's a beautiful story, you know, and so clear. It was just the, the break in the line. For well, hers as well, I don't remember her constellations so clearly, so, you know, you could see it so clearly with this, that image. Was I don't remember the constellations, but that one I do for some reason. Um, so, I mean, I've had others, you know, I had a couple in Ireland where they fell pregnant after however many years of being in Bursar. So it does happen, but of course it's not always. Sometimes you just can't lift the boulder or you've made a promise with a child and you're not a children, you know, and 
it's difficult, it's difficult to ship that. So, you know, as I've said before, the constellations, it's not a cure all, but you could do the constellation and see. Yeah. And if there's no child, <laughs> no complaints. But, because you know, well, if there's no child, you know, once you accept that, then there's so other ways of creating, you know. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's really like to, if you're in a relationship, what will bring you alongside each other? A business. Write a book. You know? Have a new project. Set up a charity. You know, do something creative that helps that flow. And so it's not that children are the be all and end all. I mean, it's, I'm very grateful for mine and my grandchildren, but there are other ways that you can find fulfillment. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. I always think of Oprah Winfrey and what she's created in the world. You know, and it's a conscious choice she made not to have children. Yeah, amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So success has the face of mother, Bert Helen just said. Why so? <laughs> well, this is, uh, he referred to it as the interrupted reaching out movement. So this is related to what I was talking about at the beginning, all the attachments. And if you have a difficult pregnancy, a traumatic birth, and you're bringing trauma also from your ancestry, then that initial concept in the baby is interrupted. So if you turn away from a tiny baby, and I've seen this, you know, because I'm up to the research project for four years, seen the baby with less than 10 days old. You, if you have a still face, we call it the still face experiment, become master, which is like depression, or you turn away, eventually, initially the, the infant would just screw up its face because of all know what's happening. And then it drops back and then it turns away. And it's really difficult to get the baby to come back again. You know, that's, the, that's the interruption to the reaching out movement. It starts there. But then when you're moving towards something, a project, a relationship, money, at the last minute, you turn away because that's the infant that you got in the very early days. And, you know, there's no blame on the mother. It's just how it is. The, the field around you, you know, it can be for all kinds of reasons. But that's the interruption. And that's what we repeat wherever we go until we realise that and then we can make that move even in old age, you know, you can still make that movement to all the representative of the mother and complete it and that success will follow. It's so important for a baby to have that sense of feeling safe with a return of love that feels uh, and, and I know Sarah Payton's work, she also says like how much joy you can express, you know to to be able to have a parent that that can mirror that joy that you feel or that delight or that rapture that many children express and some parents um for their because of their own stuff that they're going through it might be postnatal depression or something cannot meet uh that child and and it can that interruption that you said i saw you actually working with someone and it was a very beautiful process uh, where you the, the man started off sitting next to you in the chair and then in the end he was on your chest yeah yeah, I mean, you know, I've been down on the floor sometimes, you know, embracing people. You just go where they, where their body moves. You encourage them to move their body. Sometimes they do go down on the floor and you end up embracing them on the floor, you know. So it just depends on the particular movement. But that completion is, is really beautiful. And, you know, that's like when you see a mother with a baby in her arm, the baby's looking at her all the time especially with their breastfeeding, and that distance between the breasts and the eyes is the optimal distance for a time of baby to be able to see it clearly. So nature's amazing, you know, in that way. And if the infant sees themselves being seen, that's the beginning of forming a core of sense of identity and thing they are. So if that's missing, then they're going to work a whole lot harder. <laughs> that infant was there from the beginning. And, you know, it saddens me that there's so much trauma now in the process of giving birth. So many people are addicted to their phones and they're looking at their phones and their breastfeeding. You know, there's all kinds of ways that 
it's been interrupted that more part. Um, and you know, again, it's no blame or doesn't, it's just how it is. You know, we've separated from our souls to such a great extent, whether that's nature or whether it's a tiny baby, it's the same. Uh, we're, we're cut off, you know, saying we generalization falls, but largely. You know, so you look at COVID, what's happening with COVID, it's a virus. What's the instinct to, to crush it, to kill it? Kill off the virus as, you know, as quickly as we can and become afraid and that sort of thing. And they're unable to see that that's part of nature as well. Yeah. And that doesn't mean they're cautious of that, but it's like we are made of viruses. There's millions of viruses, and, you know, so to just want to crush it like that, we can't. We can't crush nature. Nature will still survive way beyond us. You know, we'll, we'll destroy ourselves. We just, you know, it's coming full circle now, but like saving the planet. No. The planet will be fine. Yeah. We need saving. We need saving. We might not be able to save ourselves, but the planet will be just fine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I represented the Earth on more than one occasion. You know, there's no emotion there. I'm just here. <laughs> just here and solid, and you can do what you want around me, you know, but I'm just here. And the same is true for animals, you know. I mean, I did a constellation once on the house that I was moving out of because there were lots of creatures coming in through the walls and all sorts of things. And when the constellation was operating, I said to the facilitator, they're not taking it seriously. You know, there didn't seem to be any emotional link or anything. She's, what do you expect? They're animals. <laughs> animals don't, you know, kill themselves with guilt or, you know. Create stories of, yeah. Or anything, they're just there. You know, they eat to survive. They, they run or they kill, you know. It's really simple. Or they freeze. Yeah. There's basic instincts or I had the way that they survive so that they're not caught up in all the, you know. I mean, it's wonderful in a way we've got the ability to self-reflect, but it's also really difficult at times <laughs> because we judge and, you know, we have stories and we make assumptions and all kinds of things. And aren't cluttered like that. It's so much clearer. <laughs> Animals would not be good for a therapy business. <laughs> well, you know, they're, I mean, horses, there's a lot more people working with horses now. You know? Yeah. They are so psychic. We're all animals. Mm. But, you know, I think that with, they have a healing yeah. energy about them and they are very beneficial for yeah. children with autism. And yeah. All kinds I mean, of I've it. seen constellations done with horses, you know, where really this guy in the Netherlands would come up and actually he's written a book and she once translated into English. You know, he, we were in a compound and there were just two horses. Uh, and he asked a question. So what what needs to happen in order for us to take care of constellation work in the future? Resources are just munching the grass, you know, <laughs> and they just very slowly turn. So one was facing out and one was facing in like that. They were right along the side each other. It's a really powerful image. And he said, well, thank you. Yeah, we need to take care of the inside and of the outside. Thank you very much. And as soon as he said thank you, they just got on with eating the grass. <laughs> yeah. It's lovely. You know, here's take it or leave it. I don't care whether you take it or leave it. If you don't, well, so be it. You know, we're just going to carry on eating the grass. <laughs> you know, it's just, it was lovely to see. What does that mean, the inside and the outside? of? Well, the people who work within constellations at the moment, you need to pay attention to what's happening on the inside like that. And they you need people at the edge. It's male, female, yeah? Mm. The pair of the half, and then people on the edge looking out in the outer thing. How are we being received out there? What do we need to do, you know, to help that boundary between the inside and the outside? Okay. Uh, we need attention to both. We need that male, female, like archetypal energy. Like, look after who's working on the inside, but also take care of how we impact it on the outside. Any business means that. If you don't look after your staff, you lose them. If you don't pay attention to how you are in the marketplace, the, the business will go down and anyway. You know, So 
you need that combination of both. And with money, the inside and the outside, the relationship inside with you, that you have with all the stuff going on and then also the doings of money or the things that activities you take or the admin. Or Yeah, yeah. And I know for myself, you know, I can have the sort of, you know, I found out a lot about my internal attitude towards money, but how I behave out in the world <laughs> is more tricky. Like my, my resistance to banks and capitalism and all this into stuff, you know, that's more difficult for me. Yeah. Outward focus is harder than the inward focus. I've got quite a bit of understanding of how, what my process is, but how I interact with it in the outer world is, is more tricky. I need to, to be able to do both. You need help to do both. So running money workshops doesn't mean I'm, I'm totally clear and resolved about money. <laughs> And I wonder if it's that archetypal relationship that women have with money where we, we tend to be like when like when you say it's soulful, you know, there's care uh, and a connection with your work. I'm not saying men don't, but um, the archetypal energy is is when I care, I don't always want to charge because, you know, this is coming from love. So I feel that, too, you know. Yeah, I do. Think there's more flow for men. I think it's somehow. I mean, again, we're generalizing, but I. I told you this before, but I went to a computer exhibition with my ex-husband many years ago, before we had children, I think. And I walked into this room when it was 99% men. I think it might have been a couple of women. It's probably changed a bit now, but I think it's still predominantly men in the computer, IT world. <clears throat> and as I walked in, the energy in there was absolutely electric. And I remember saying to my goodness, it's this energy could be turned into something more positive, more, I can't remember what word I used, more caring, more charitable, more soulful. The world would be transformed overnight. You know, I felt that so strongly. Um, and, and yet, you know, I'm kind of judging what's good and what's bad in that, you know. <laughs> Well, it is soulful work. Some businessmen are very soulful in their approach. You know, I mean, Ty, Ty, who I've worked with, he has no worries at all about talking about love, you know, in his very corporate world that he works in. But he's, he's managed to bring those two together, you know, in himself. So I think it's possible to do that, but none I think it, it's still, you know, we're still in that era where money, male, Money is easier for the female. Because for me, it's like my predominant thing is I want to do this work. I want this work to be passed on. And the, the sort of bit that I have to tolerate going along with that is, and I need the money, you know. So there isn't a sense of, oh, wow, I'm going to make all this money. You know? It doesn't, I don't know. I, I can't fit that in me somehow, you know. So it's, it's interesting. I mean, it's nice if I do all done, but inside, it's not the dominant thing. The dominant thing. I want this word to spread. Uh, there's a phrase that I do these money workshops uh, following through the work of Peter Koenig. And one of the things we say is do what you, you know, do the work that you want to do and trust that life will take care of your needs. The money may or may not follow, do the work anyway, and trust that life will take care of your needs, you know, but that's a big leap. That's a big leap for most people with big mortgages and, you know, like like the energy bills going up and things, you, you know, if I said that to some of my clients, they'd look at me like with two horns coming out of my head because it is not logical, but there is, um, there is something else that's mysterious that goes on, and I do believe that. But it also, you know, the propaganda is very fear-inducing, you know, and I think that, the, all the stuff about the rising energy bills and that sort of thing, There's, it triggers fear in people. And so if you've got fear around money, money will just disappear. You know, I know that myself. If I get into a fearful place and money, off it goes, you know, it just is not <laughs> Yeah, because when you're contracted, you're trying to control the show and you can't control the show. Yeah, you know, and if you get anxious, you get tight and... I mean, the, the ears are very tight in relation to money, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, and the money just disappears, you know. And I mean, I have a friend who uh, works with individual clients, and she got really panicky because all their clients started disappearing, you know. But her mum was really ill. And I said, you know, maybe your clients are just looking after you. You need some space because your mum is ill. She's dying, you know. 
And sure enough, you know, once her mum had died and she got through the initial grief around it, clients came back, you know, it's just beautiful, the flow. It was looking after her in a way, moving away because she needed the space to be with her mother in her last days, you know. So once that had happened, back the clients came, you know, and I think when you work for yourself, you see that more clearly. Mm-hmm. When you're within a corporation, you get your regular salary generally. You, know, you don't see those shifts, those ways in the same day, same way as you do for yourself employed. If you're self employed, I know for me, it just mirrors my state. You know, and if I'm anxious or tight or anything, or good money, you know, it goes off all over the whole deck for a while. You know? And then when I'm nourished and I feel relaxed and I'm carrying myself back, it comes, you know. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. There is uh, also the, the role of intuition and in, like accepting clients and wanting to work with clients as well. Yeah. Yeah. And the intuition plays a really strong role. It plays a strong role in consolation work. Mm. And in a way, that's the essence of the training. Mm. Be yourself, trust your own instincts, learn all the ropes, but then forget them, you know, and just be you and be yourself and just follow whatever instincts you have, you know. And that will work whether it's with money or, or any kind of constellations. If you're fully aligned with who you are, the flow is there. The flow is in you, the flow is in the group, and then the flow is in the constellation. So I asked about mother. So I, to be fair, I also have to ask, what about the father's role with money? And also I want to cover same sex couples. How would the dynamic work? I remember you saying, maybe I got this wrong, but, um, and you can clarify that the mother, energy is like nurturing and you know protecting and loving and then the father's is more like risk taking or you know like when you fall in the playground the father will say come on get up go and play go on yeah that's so good. is that the yeah i mean in essence that's what sport is kids so you know it, in a way you're looking back to primitive times yeah we've moved a long way from that but it's, it's so interesting that the essence is still there at some level yeah, so so yes, that female energy is nurturing, looking after the heart, if you like. So the family gathered around, you know, so it's that movement, if you like. And the man, the male energy is, it's my target. I've got to go and hunt that animal. Yeah. And can't, I can't be distracted by anything else. That's my target. That's my focus. That's why I have to go. And so as the father, I say to the child, come on. You know, here's the world, there's the target, come with me, let's go hunt that animal together. Yeah. So that's that's the kind of archetypal process. In some cultures, they still have that, you know, so young males, they get to puberty and they go with the father, you know, into the father's sphere and he helps them out into the big wide world. You know, that ritual doesn't exist for women in the same way, you know, so we have to work harder in a certain way, you know. And I remember Nancy Friday, she wrote a book called The Power of Beauty, where she talked about women going into the business world, but not as women. Like they put thousand suits on, and they got their briefcase, they decided they had to become like men in order to enter the business world. And, you know, she was basically saying, what a shame, you know, because actually if we could go into the business world as women, with all of our faculties as women, we would change things. You know, things would be different. And certainly when I worked in business, I was seven years in business before I saw the children. And my dad would never go back into business. I was told I was too emotional and I was too principal. There was more two things I'm so I was also going to how to be male in order to be in a, in a very male dominating company i did i didn't want it you know so i was i was this sort of you know fighting with my my spears and trying to fight for the rights of the women and this sort of thing you know very interesting looking back on me but yeah i didn't want to become male you know but i mean nonetheless i do have a lot of men and it's so interesting it's certainly becoming more acceptable to, like, for men to be emotional, for women to be more assertive, for women, yeah, I think we're losing some of these old judgments. See, it feels like the consciousness is changing and we're becoming more inclusive and more accepting, but of course we have quite a way to go, but 
it seems like like people are at least aware of you know oh I like I'll say a word and I'll say oh I shouldn't have said that you know like there are edges to the growth we are going through I think yeah I mean I think there's a lot that's better you know I think you know there's masses of you know greater self not self acceptance acceptance of others acceptance of difference and you know, patriarchy is much less than it was and that sort of thing. So I think there is a coming together, but there's, there's a loss in that as well. Yeah. The excitement of difference, that sort of thing. And I mean, you were talking about same sex couples. You see, even in a same sex couple, in my experience, there always seems to be one of the couple that is more out in the world than the other. You know, so even in that, you've got some male energy operation even if it's two women or two men you know um so i think that's fascinating to kind of see that and i you know i have only worked with a limited number of people from the lb lbq what is it now it's a long that's it yes <laughs> um but you know the ones i have worked with i've seen that there is a difference between the two well in one seems more out with focus and the other one does yeah, and also in male female stuff. Sometimes the male is more nurturing, and and a male love can be like I always say the best empathy I ever got in my whole life was from a priest who was my like my childhood family priest. He was a redemptorist priest, and he was just like so solid in his presence, you know. Like, yeah. So of course we've been generalizing in our conversation, but I want people to know <laughs> that's not our intention. Um, and then one thing we talked about uh, was about adoption. So some adopted people like Steve Jobs, who founded Apple, you know, he's gone on to be really, really successful. So he doesn't have that natural, whatever, parents and all of that force behind him. Um, I suppose, is he the exception to the rule? And I'll make that my last question because you've gone over our time. <laughs> yeah. Some people are able to turn their trauma into something positive. Now, I don't know how he feels underneath the success, of course. You know, he may be very successful, but deeply unhappy underneath. We have no, we have no way of knowing that. Yeah. Uh, but if he is happy and successful, I would say he's made use of his trauma. He's turned it into something positive for him. And and you do see that. You see people who are deeply traumatized, and they kind of grab hold of their trauma and they say, "Okay, I'm going to do something with this. You know, to make use of it in some. I'm going to help others in some ways." So then it becomes a transformation process rather than burying themselves in the grief of them, you know, because adoption is so huge. It's a difficult scene to come through from. You know, I made a film with a guy who's adopted, you know, and so and said, I don't want it to be glamorized, you know, this is awful. You know. And he showed how awful it was, my experience, even though he had adopted parents and were pretty good to him. Nonetheless, that initial rift is massive. So I would say with Steve Bob, either he's deeply unhappy under me, or he's transferred all this trauma into something really positive. Well, that was really fascinating. Before you go, Barbara, could you share how people can reach you and your work and your and your books? And yeah, I mean, I have uh, two websites. Um, I edit the International Constellations Journal, and that website is www knowingfield.com and then my website about my trainings and my books and all that sort of thing is cominghome.org.uk Hopefully it should give people a fascinating insight into what money family constellations can do and, and hopefully people will go and explore this lens if it resonates for them. Yeah, yeah, I would hope so. It is a really good way of uncovering what you're not aware of maybe, you know, and people getting stuck around money issues then. Come and find out. Set up money and see what money tells you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Barbara. Particularly, I know I do it better.